Please go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation to uh, present in, in this workshop. As I was saying before, it's a shame to not be able to uh, have the meeting in, in person, but uh, I look forward to hopefully being able to, to see many of you uh, sometime soon. Um, so what I'm going to present today are some thoughts about a possible naming scheme for exotic hadrons. Uh, this is coming out of discussions that we've been having within LHCB. Uh, and we think that the time is, is right to uh, involve more people outside uh, uh, LHCB uh, in this discussion, as clearly this is something that is, is not relevant only uh, for LHCB. So I'll, I'll try to be relatively brief with the, the talk, um, just to sort of explain the background and, and what we're thinking, and then leave as much time as possible for, for discussion, because really I'd like to hear uh, what sort of thoughts the... the, the people like yourselves and, and uh, eventually others in the community have about this. So uh, as you know, over the last few years, there have been quite a few uh, discoveries that do not fit into the uh, existing naming convention. So I'll call this the PDG naming convention. That basically means the PDG is where it is specified. Um, uh, and so, these are the uh, discoveries at the LHC. It's a very nice plot that's prepared by my colleague, uh, Patrick Koppenberg. Um, of course, the discovery is also in other places, but this is one plot, at least, that gives you a good picture of what's happened at the LHC. Uh, so what you see on the y-axis is the mass of the, the new states, and along the x-axis is the, the date, uh, which is actually the, the date of the archive submission. And uh, so these are all the, the new hadrons that have been discovered at the LHC. And of course, most of them fit into the, the classical scheme of, of, of mesons and baryons. So uh, we can see that the ones down here near the bottom, these are essentially uh, mostly uh, charm states. Uh, the ones uh, higher up in this band over here are, are beauty states. Uh, and then the ones in the middle uh, tend to be uh, charmonia or charmonia-like states, including several uh, that I've circled that are manifestly exotic in the, on the base of their, their quantum numbers. So these include the pentaquark states, which are labeled PC, um, but also uh, these uh, ZCS tetraquark states uh, and the, the TCC, which is the most recent discovery. And then also um, up here, uh, we have the X6900, uh, which decays to uh, a pair of J size. Uh, so there is not no scheme for how these should be, be named, and we've come up with names as we sort of go along. And if the rate of discoveries continues, and um, who knows what will happen in the future, but maybe that's a reasonable guideline, then there will be more things that we discover that we won't know how to name. And uh, rather than just making it up as we go along, it would be better to have some kind of scheme. So I don't really need to remind this audience, I think, but uh, since I have the slide here, I will do anyway. So this is the PDG naming convention. An important thing to stress is that it is based on uh, measured properties of the state, in particular, the quantum numbers and the mass. Uh, it is not based on speculation about what the internal structure might be. So on the left, uh, we see a table. This is for the, the mesons with uh, no net strangeness or heavy flavor quantum numbers. Um, and in addition to that, we've got things, of course, like the, the D, the B, the B sub C, the D sub S, and, and so on. Uh, but there is, although this has been expanded over the last few years to include these uh, isospin one states that contain either CC bar or BB bar, there is no rule for exotic mesons with uh, either strangeness, charm, or beauty quantum numbers. And uh, the, the baryons, as you know, are, are named with a symbol that depends uh, mainly on the isospin with subscripts to denote a heavy flavor. Uh, but, um, uh, and this has been essentially extended to follow the name uh, that was given by LHEB for the charmonium pentaquarks, which are called P sub C. Uh, but there's no obvious way to extend this to other um, pentaquarks with, with other um, heavy flavor quantum numbers. So just to give some specific examples, um, almost two years ago now, we published results showing uh, a discovery of states which we called X2900, both uh, spin zero and spin one, which are uh, D minus K plus resonances. 
So they contain both charm and strange quarks, not charm anti-strange like a D sub S, but charm strange and uh, presumably U bar D bar. Uh, so uh, we've labeled these X because essentially we don't know what else to call them. There is no name for them. And uh, we don't yet know their isospin. So that sort of gives us an excuse to use this X symbol because we don't know all their quantum numbers, but uh, assuming we can uh, either discover or rule out the existence of partners in the coming years, what should those states then be called when we do know their isospin? Uh, there's uh, additional tetraquark states that we've labeled ZCS. These are discovered as JSIK resonances. Uh, and uh, all the quantum numbers have been uh, determined uh, for these, um, at least for the, the lighter one, uh, that the heavy one has a little ambiguity on the, uh, the spin parity. Um, but uh, there was no name for these. We've called these ZCS. This actually breaks the PDG convention. In hindsight, maybe it was not the best choice. Uh, we thought these, these look like things that we call Z states, but the PDG convention is that Z is for isospin one. And as I just said, these are isospin a half. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, the Charmonium pentacrox P sub C states. Um, uh, we are using this name. We've also seen uh, possible uh, J psi lambda resonances, which have been denoted PCS. But this is quite interesting because now we've got these two subscripts, but the C denotes that it contains hidden charm, CC bar, whereas the S denotes that it contains open strangeness. So the meaning of each of these subscripts is a bit different. And uh, let's say, for example, that uh, a pentaquark that contains open charm is discovered, which seems quite plausible. We've seen tetraquarks with open charm, so why not pentaquarks? Uh, then what would we what would we call that? So uh, we don't have answers to these questions, and that essentially uh, points us to need for a new naming scheme. And I think eventually, of course, there has to be some some new scheme, assuming the rate of discoveries continues. Doesn't have to be now, but it has to happen eventually. So if it happens to happen eventually, well, wouldn't it's probably better to get on and do it sooner? So um, so. Uh, what would we like to have a, a naming scheme? So this uh, reminds me a little bit of the, the joke of a, a tourist in, um, in Ireland. I don't know why it's in, in Ireland, but anyway, that's the way I know the joke. And the tourist is lost and stops to ask a local, um, you know, how do I get to wherever it is that they're going to? And the local stops, thinks for a moment and says, well, I wouldn't start from here. And, uh, you know, we would like to, to come up with a uh, compact, concise naming scheme that contains all of the information in a clear and logical way. But we would also like to build on the existing uh, scheme. And the existing scheme has some idiosyncrasies. Uh, so it, you know, it's important to say we're not trying to start from a blank sheet of paper. We're trying to build on, on the uh, existing scheme and um, not change things for established states uh, as much as possible. Uh, but that has consequences that the, the scheme is, is not, uh, you know, just a, uh, as simple as logical as it should be. Uh, one very important part of this scheme is that it's based on measure, measured, measurable and measured properties, uh, not on interpretation, as I mentioned before. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's what we would like to find. So we've had quite a lot of discussions, different ideas been kicked around for just to, to try and keep things concise, I'm going to propose what I think is now the preferred scheme. I say from the outset, it's not possible. You probably shoot holes in it, but there have been lots of discussions. All the other schemes have at least as many other problems as far as we can we can tell. Um, but this doesn't exclude that a, a better solution could still be found, of course. So yeah, so I'll, I'll present a suggestion. As I said, we've had a lot of discussion um, to reach this stage. Um, but hopefully, you know, it can still be improved further if we if we have better ideas, and hopefully we can we can converge uh, reasonably soon. So, uh, I, as a, a nickname, we call this proposal ISO superscript. And as I'll explain on the next slides, the basic idea is that uh, tetraquark states, so states with zero baryon number, which manifestly have at least four uh, quarks in them, we label with T. And uh, the pentaquarks, so again, states that manifestly have uh, contain five quarks, meaning quark plus antiquarks, uh, we label with P. 
And then uh, the isospin, we sort of follow the existing PDG convention that the isospin is something that, that should be conveyed in the symbol, and we include that as a superscript. Uh, so for the um, for the pentaquarks, that follows the, the symbols that are in use, lambda for isospin zero, n uh, for isospin a half, uh, and then uh, sigma and delta um, for isospin one and three halves. Um, don't know if we'll ever discover one with three halves, but in principle, that's that's there. Uh, then for the, uh, similarly for the uh, tetraquarks, the superscripts uh, follow the um, labels for pseudoscalars. Uh, so of course, eta and pi for zero and one. Uh, an isospin a half, um, meson is of course a k on, uh, but we thought it's probably better not to put k here, that, that would be potentially confusing. Uh, so we use theta, which you'll remember is one of the sort of, um, uh, old-fashioned names of the of the kaon uh, back in the days of the, the so-called theta tau puzzle. So uh, yeah, so that's the the basic idea. As I said, there. then on top of uh, this uh, superscript that indicates the isospin, then there are subscripts to denote the um, the flavor content. And the idea here is that if they contain hidden beauty, charm, or strangeness. Uh, and the strangeness often won't be manifest, but sometimes it could be. Uh, but then we use, uh, again, the Greek symbols, which are those for the, uh, the vector mesons in this case. Now, this doesn't mean that this particle contains a vector meson. We're just using this same symbol to denote uh, the presence of hidden beauty, charm, or strangeness. And then uh, for open flavor content, uh, we use B, C, or S. Uh, and you have to be a little bit careful when we're talking about the flavor. So the idea is that these indicate the quarks that are contained, not the flavor quantum number, uh, because of course an S quark has negative strangeness and so on. So, uh, but if, if uh, we have a subscript S, that means that that particle contains an S quark, and then the antiparticle version of it, of course, contains an, an S bar. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so there's some examples given here, but I'll, I'll show some more examples in, uh, in the slides that come. So I'll go skip over that. Uh, just to mention, we haven't tried to extend this for six or seven quark states, but you can sort of imagine how that, that could uh, be extended, hopefully with, uh, without to, um, problems there that, 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 that we haven't thought about yet. Okay, and then the rest of the proposal is basically the same as in the existing convention. So for mesons, we have an additional subscript for spin and use the uh, star superscript to denote natural spin parity. Uh, so from these two, you can, you can tell uniquely uh, the, uh, the spin and the, the parity. Uh, the, uh, for baryons, the convention is that the spin parity is specified after the symbols. And so again, just do the same thing here for the, the P states. And as usual, the mass in parentheses, the charge as a, a superscript, um, although it can be dropped when it's not needed. Um, we imagine a, a lot of the other symbols, you, know, you end up with quite a, a lot of subscripts and superscripts, but sometimes these will be obvious and so it's not, uh, won't be necessary to include. Them. So uh, the impact on existing states. Uh, so the ZC and ZB, so remember these are uh, isospin one states that contain CC bar or BB bar. Uh, so uh, the, now the convention is that the uh, hidden uh, flavor content should be denoted by either psi or epsilon. Uh, these are minimum four quark content. So they are T states and they are isospin one. So they have a superscript of pi. So the first is T pi psi, and the second is T pi epsilon. Uh, this uh, ZCS state, which as I said before, shouldn't really have been called a Z because it's isospin a half. Uh, so this is a T theta state. It contains hidden charm, so with a psi subscript, and it contains uh, open strangeness, so with an S subscript. Uh, its uh, quantum numbers have been measured to be one plus, so the spin one is a further subscript uh, and it is not natural spin parity, so no star. Uh, the X6900 uh, is isospin zero. So this would technically be T eta, although it is obvious that this is isospin zero. So here you would imagine the eta would probably be dropped in practice uh, and it contains two lots of hidden charm. So it has subscript psi psi. Uh, 
this you might think is quite a long notation, but actually in, in quite a lot of the literature, this is being denoted T subscript CC bar CC bar. So this at least is, is not worse than that in terms of the length uh, of the symbol. Uh, and then these states with, with that contain both charm and strange quarks I mentioned before. So if we assume that these are isospin zero, then these will be T eta, uh, subscript C, S and zero star for the spin zero, which is a zero plus state. Uh, the spin one is a one minus, so that would be T eta C, S one star. Uh, and if they are isospin one instead of zero, then instead of being T eta, they are T pi states. And just to reiterate, uh, there is no change to any state that does not, not uh, have manifestly exotic quantum numbers. So perhaps the one which people think about the most in this discussion is the X3872, also known as the Chi C1 3872, and that remains the Chi C1 3872. If there is no change to that, there is no change to uh, any other conventional uh, hadron. Uh, for the exotic baryons, so the pentaquark states, so the P sub C states, because these contain hidden uh, charm, these will be P sub psi. Uh, and uh, assuming these are isospin a half, then they should be P superscript N. Again, this may be a place where that superscript is felt to be obvious and so could just be dropped in practice. Uh, and the PCS states uh, would be, uh, so these are uh, presumably isospin zero because they decay to J psi lambda. Uh, so that would be P superscript lambda subscript psi S. So uh, this table then sort of summarizes what I've said and gives uh, a bit more detail and you know, I think that the general feeling when one of the, the comments that people have had about this scheme, and in fact, pretty much every scheme, is that we get a bit overloaded with symbols. There's quite a lot of subscripts and superscripts. And that is, is true. But uh, as I've mentioned, I think in, you know, in many cases, actually, it's not that bad. And in practice, some, uh, quite a lot of these symbols would be, would be dropped where they are felt obvious. Uh, so um, yeah, so that is all I've really wanted to say. Just to conclude, uh, we think it is possible to come up with a scheme uh, that satisfies what we want, the scheme. Um, it relatively simple following existing principles and use, reusing existing symbols uh, as much as possible. Uh, it is not perfectly backwards compatible. In particular, as I mentioned, the Z sub C and Z sub B states would uh, have their names changed in this, but, uh, but it, it, all conventional or states which are consistent with being conventional hadrons uh, are unchanged. Um, there are some annoying features. I mentioned some names will be changed. It's quite a lot of subscripts and superscripts. Uh, but as I've said before, nothing is perfect. This is hopefully good enough and, and something which could be built on. And uh, yes, I'd look forward to uh, to getting um, your feedback. So uh, just, yeah, as a very last slide, uh, this of course is not the first time that uh, um, naming conventions have changed. Uh, uh, the, the, the the last major change, I, I think, was in, uh, in the 1980s. And uh, this was something which had first use of, of Twitter in my scientific career, I, I actually learned about this uh, through through Twitter, this this link. So there's this uh, article in from the CERN Courier describing that, that change back in the 1980s. I think what we're trying to do is very similar now. Hopefully, um, if we get it right, uh, we can be as successful as, as that scheme has been and uh, can be used for, um, for another uh, 40 years uh, from now. So yes, let me finish there. And uh, yeah, I look forward to uh, hearing your, your comments. Thanks, Tim, for this uh, proposal of organizing our zoo of particles. Um, I see Osset have a question about him, please. Yeah, hi, Tim. I mean, a nice initiative. Yeah, I think, I mean, that was a bit most needed. 
Now let me add, I mean, something, I mean, a few comments about that. The, you have there this theta, I mean, when I saw the theta, I didn't understand, I mean, the theta. I didn't understand what was it. Then you explained that that was, I mean, the old name for the K. So why don't you put the K, which is just the new name that everyone will understand. I mean, the theta no one will remember. Okay, that is one thing. Eh? Okay, yeah. now, yes, one th another thing is, you know, I mean, uh, at the end you decided, I mean, to not change, I mean, the X, the GC1, I mean, 3,872, and leave the name, I mean, of GC1. But, you know, GC1, I mean, this uh, nomenclature is uh, assuming that it is QQR. Now, I mean, uh, there is debate on that, I mean, uh, on what is the structure and will continue forever. But I mean, uh, uh, the thing is that no one thinks is a QQ bar. I mean, some people think is, I mean, uh, a track bar, others think it's a molecule, but I mean, uh, no one, I mean, uh, is just waiting, I mean, for a QQ bar. So why, I mean, I mean, uh, put, I mean, a nomenclature, which is just based on the QQ bar, I mean, I mean, uh, a structure. Right. And then, so let me... and then, yes, and then finally, and then you can, I mean, I mean uh, one thing, the X0, 2,900, 900, you have there, I mean, which is fine, it's clear. T, C, S, zero, eta, star. What does the star mean? Why do you put a star there? Okay, and that's all. Okay, let's see. Okay, so th thank you very much for the questions. Let me let me take the, the uh, second of the three first, if I can. So, uh, so what you said is that, that you said the naming Chi C1 3872 implies that it is a QQ bar state. That is not correct in the PDG naming convention. The, the naming convention does not it tell you anything at all about what the internal structure is. Uh, it only tells you what the quantum numbers are. So that means that the name is simply correlates to the, the mass, uh, which you have in parentheses, and the, the quantum numbers. And Chi C1 uh, simply means that it's uh, J, P, C quantum numbers are one plus plus which are all measured properties. So that is the existing convention for those states. And uh, I am not proposing to make any change to that. Um, uh, I, I know, uh, I think I saw Christoph connected. So Christoph may possibly have some, something more to, to add on that before I move to the other points. No, in this context, is that I can can uh, do completely back what you said. We had long discussions about this um, TIC1 uh, uh, 3872 state, but the problem really is that we cannot take sides. Oh, well, I'm now speaking with the head of being a member of the people in charge of the PDG naming scheme. So just to make clear what party I'm in at the moment. Um, and uh, the point is that we cannot take sides on the structure. Therefore, there are debates also about other states that for a while were established as quark model states and then discussions start whether they have an exotic content, like the lowest, the, the first excited Chi C2, also people claim that it might be an exotic state. We cannot just decide on the basis of democracy how many papers there are on the one side or on the other and adapt the name, that's not possible. So for the, eventually we came up with sticking to the original statement in the PDG naming write-up uh, that the uh, name only implies quantum numbers and nothing else. And then we did not have a choice but to call the X3872 as um, Chi C1 3872, but as a sort of comp line of compromise. So if, while the official uh, PDG name is Chi C1 3872. We have it explicitly written also known as X3872. Uh, and therefore, in principle, one can use both names equivalently without violating any rules, if you like rules. Yeah. Okay, but, okay but, uh, Tim, please go on with, with the other questions. Very good, very good. There's a question from Elisabetta that cannot raise the hand. Hey. Exactly. Uh, Elisabetta posted on Elisabetta. Yeah, I didn't want just to jump in the discussion and the type. Uh, you didn't mention anything about uh, the Y states, the one seen in ISR. Do you have a proposal also for those? Uh, yeah, okay, let me, let me answer Eulogio's uh, other questions first, and then, then I, I come back to that. 
So I think the others I can be uh, quite quick on. So first of all, the star indicates natural spin parity for mesons. That again, that is part of the existing convention. Uh, so if we have a state with a, a subscript one, for example, if it has a star, that means that its spin parity is one minus. Uh, if it doesn't have a star, then it's one plus. Okay. Uh, okay. So that okay. is is the same as we we have now. For example, uh, ah, okay. D, d sub good. s one versus d sub s one star. Very good. 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 Um, then the the other question was about why we preferred theta in terms of k. Uh, yeah, I think that's a fair fair point. I, I think the the feeling was that if if we had a K in it, that would sort of make people somehow think that this state is a, is a K on, uh, whereas that's not what we mean. We, we mean that simply that it has isospin a ha. Now, um, and, and it um, uh, doesn't necessarily uh, decay to uh, a state that contains a K on, of course, as, uh, for isospin a ha. Now, now that concern actually also applies to the symbols for the, for the baryons, for example, having a, having a, a lambda in it uh, might make people think that, that that means that it has to decay to a lambda, uh, whereas here we just mean that it's isospin zero, but at least in the baryons, we also have the lambda C and the lambda B. So there's kind of this idea that, that it's maybe already a bit familiar that lambda means isospin zero and doesn't necessarily uh, mean anything to do with the, the strangeness content. Okay, good. good, good, good. So that, was, that was the idea, um, whether or not it's, successful, um, I, I, I leave you to, to, to judge. Yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, so let me now uh, come to uh, Elisabetta's question uh, about the, the Y states. Uh, so by and large, I think these would, would not be affected uh, in that uh, these are states similar to the discussion about the, the, the Chi-C 138.72. Uh, which the quantum numbers uh, do not uh, by themselves give you, tell you that they have four quark or five quark content. So those are, um, are unchanged. Yeah, okay, already uh, those are psi, psi states uh, if they have CC bar content and upsilon states if they have BB bar content. But this was already in the previous PDG issue. Yeah, that's already that's already. Yes, uh, it is already. Last, uh, it's already like that. So they are one minus minus with BB bar content uh, is uh, an upsilon uh, and uh, one minus minus with CC bar is a psi. Yeah, so long as they are isospin zero states. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, we are like running out of time, but we have a last question from Christoph, and then we we move on. Chris, please, Chris. Thank you. This is for um, a comment. I just wanted to quickly show what will be in the next review of particle physics. Wait a second. Here we go. Therefore, this is a car the table that will be in the next naming scheme write up of um, the review of particle physics. Therefore, we've included the name ZCS now because that was the name given in the uh, original publication. And it says here I equal to one half. But I agree, this is not probably the ideal choice because the, the C and the S play different roles. And also these names here, these, the, the names in brackets are names we suggested for states that haven't been found yet. The ones in brackets haven't been found yet. The ones without brackets already have an entry in the, in the book. Therefore, this RC is already in the book, for instance. However, this doesn't mean that this cannot be changed. And I agree also that this is not, you, your names are longer, but on the other hand, more self-explaining. So what I would suggest to proceed is the following, that uh, you know that the list of authors of this naming scheme of hadrons is long. Therefore, everybody will find this write up in the current version and soon in the updated version on the PDG pages. You see, there are many people here on the list. There are a few who sign up for baryons, like Volker Bokart, Ulrike Thoma, uh, Ron Workman, Lothar Tiator. 
And a few who sign up for um, basically for the Mason site, that's uh, Ryan, Claudia, uh, and myself for the moment. And my suggestion would be, um, Tim, if that's fine with you, as you are sort of taking the lead role in this uh, naming game from the LACB side, as far as I understand, that all authors together with the uh, PDG representative for this review uh, and you have some uh, Zoom meeting, we can set up a doodle for that. And then we discuss that in the round, say probably in something like a month from now. From now. And we should then, uh, if anybody has a suggestion on how to improve on the scheme just suggested, please write an email. Uh, probably to Tim or to myself. And then so probably a month from now, we should, should have a Zoom meeting to initiate the discussions um, to see uh, what we can do. And my personal goal would be not to have those changes imposed for the 2022 uh, issue, because that's too short. The um, sort of the, the uh, round of changes is already through and LVL is already busy with implementing, uh, with pro providing the new review. So well, that's a lot of work for them. I don't want to intervene because a lot of changes would be necessary in order to catch up with the new naming, but to really aim at a um, community-wide consensus for the 2024 issue, probably already the 2023 update. Um, but for that, I think it's it's still timely to, to start with, uh, say, in a month from now. Yeah, Is that something that finds consensus? I, I think that's a great idea. Um, and uh, I think uh, you, we can uh, discuss this more in a bit. But I don't know, Tim, you have a final word to say? Yeah, apologies. My Zoom crashed, so I, I missed uh, at least the first half of what Christoph was saying. So maybe we, we, can, we can follow up offline, but it, it, at least in the second half, it, it sounds like um, you're proposing to have further discussion, let people think about it and discuss. I, I certainly certainly agree yeah. with that. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to, to chat and maybe you know, if there's not enough time for discussion here, if anyone wants to, to contact me and we can either exchange emails or, or uh, arrange a, a quick chat another time, I'd be, be very I happy. I have only one yeah. question uh, for I later. Think really, uh, I'm sorry, we really, really, yeah. Claudia, we really, really out the, later. Okay. about 10 minutes. So, uh, so I'm really sorry to cut. I think we can keep this, this discussion.